we all have a tendency to hide things from ourselves and to to have wishful thinking and to deny reality. And therefore, many groups of people often want to celebrate their subgroup by contrast with the rest of the world and call themselves reality-based or, you know, more realistic as a way of disparaging their opponents and celebrating their own community. So almost everybody does this. Almost all subgroups claim that the other people are self-deceived and won't look at reality and they're the ones who are realistic. So the fact that this particular group does that as well isn't much evidence that they are, in fact, the accurate people compared to everybody else, right? I mean, that doesn't mean they're wrong. It just means this is what everybody says. They might happen to be the ones who are more realistic. That's a separate question to evaluate. Robin Hansen, welcome to the show. Hello. If you were to describe yourself, who you are, what you do, and your contributions to humanity, in the best way possible, possibly for humans that are existing now or for the future species of humans to come, how best would you go about doing that? Well, I, I feel obligated to point out that ordinary human norms tell me that I shouldn't answer those questions, that, <laughs> that I should leave that to other people to speak about me. Most people think it's a little arrogant and self-centered to summarize your role and status in the world, uh, it's just a common human norm. So, uh, you know, I, I am an associate professor of economics. I am somewhat of a polymath who does a lot of different things. I've tried to, you know, find insights into important topics. And of course, I each thing I do, I do because I think it's the most important thing. And I look for neglected important things that I can help with. And I think I've made progress on important questions, but again, the usual stance is to leave that to others to judge. That's interesting. Um, what's the most recent neglected thing that you've come across? Well, in the last year, I focused on the topic of the sacred. That is, um, it had kind of been in my way. So, I mean, I was very religious as a kid. My parents and my siblings are very religious. Uh, so religion had always been a big part of my early life, and then I drifted away from it. Uh, but in the last decades, I've thought a lot about trying to design and promote alternative institutions of various sorts. And then people have often said something like, well, you know, you're messing with the sacred. And that's why people don't like these things. And so I decided I would figure that out. <laughs> I would take the topic and make sense of it. So that's, in some sense, the last big thing I did over the last year. What is one thing that you've discovered about the sacred in the last, in your one year of research that you think would be like a pithy statement, basically, that people can connect with? Well, the, the summary would be, there is this phenomena by which people treat things sacredly. It's not just religion. Uh, people can treat many things sacredly. I collect 68 correlates of the sacred, um, things that tend to go along with that, and I try to explain those correlates, and the summary is that we can explain those correlates primarily via our using sacred things to bind together into groups. So that's really the fundamental function that the sacred forms, but we find it easier to do that indirectly than directly. We could just say, I'm into you and you're into me and we're going to stick together. But then if one of us seems to, you know, not be, be, seem to be betraying us or something, that's fragile and can break apart. But if we bind together by seeing something else together as sacred and knowing that we are the people who see that together as sacred, that binds us together more strongly and more resistant to disturbances. And that's a way to understand why it's there and how it works. So there's there's a lot more details to, to go into, but that's the summary. That's interesting. Um, and I think there's a general thread across all of your work that points to the fact that humans are deeply social. And um, if I could even say, I could say that it's almost as if all of our existence is 
determined by the degrees to which we are social and to the degrees which we play these social games. And in your book called The Elephant in the Brain, you mentioned that um, the, the, elephant, the idea of the elephant in the brain is one of the greatest contributors to our social lives and is one of the most important um, things that bring about the social dynamics that we are currently in. Could you explain that concept to someone who has never heard of the idea of the elephant in the brain before and how it ties to our social life? So we are social creatures, obviously, uh, animals. And a lot of what we do is social in the sense that we are trying to look good to each other, form alliances, select our associates carefully, um, show them our loyalty and our abilities. Um, that's a big part of what we do. And the key point is we aren't very aware of that. We are in our minds thinking we're doing other things and we are somewhat aware that we're social creatures doing these social things, but we think that's a relatively minor part of our lives and a minor contribution to our behavior. And when we do many specific things, what we have in our head as our motives is something other than these social functions. Uh, when we go to the doctor or go to school or vote or laugh or donate to charity, et cetera. And there's a bunch of ways in which that doesn't make sense. That is the story we tell about why we do things doesn't actually fit very well with our behavior. And in order to make better sense of it, what you need to do is postulate that these behaviors have other functions that we're not very conscious of. And it, they achieve those functions well. And, but you are not aware of your motives. So the key idea is that um, when you, the things you say in your head about why you're doing many things are just not the main reasons you're doing those things. Uh, your, your behavior functions well to achieve things, but um, not the things that you have in your head. So our, our book goes through a third of the book explaining the general idea how it could be that you might be wrong about your motives. And then the last two thirds goes through 10 specific areas of life trying to show in some detail. First, what are the various puzzles that don't make sense from the point of view of your usual story about why you do things, and then a better explanation that fits them better, but that tends to be more social. So what was your own, what, what surprised you about your own hidden motives after you came to discover this idea? Like, did you ever look into your personal life and say, oh, hey, this was probably why I did this when I was way younger, or this is why I'm currently still doing this now, and what was the most surprising one for you? Our general strategy is not to look at ourselves first. Our strategy is to set ourselves aside and look at typical human behavior, average human behavior, and ask, how can we understand that? How can we make sense of average human behavior? And then only at the very end, once we've got our decent explanations for typical human behavior, then, if necessary, come back to ourselves. Uh, at that point, we will, of course, face the contradiction that everyone has, which is these motives that we've identified in our abstract analysis of people in general. Do not We don't recognize them so much in the thoughts in our head and the way we feel about our behavior. Um, and you could, on that basis, say, well, either these theories are just wrong about everybody, or I'm different and they're wrong about me, or... You could say, I'm obviously not very aware of myself. So that's where I think we should go, that last position. Um, you should just trust your own introspection into your own thoughts and feelings much less than you should trust an analysis, uh, robust analysis of average human behavior across space and time, and conclude you're really not that different from everybody else. I mean, you might be different, but... Um, probably not in the ways that you wish you were different. If I, if I understand what you're saying, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, are you saying that because it's the nature of a blind spot to not be able to see past the blind spot, so we can't necessarily tell best ours, but we can tell based on observing other people that blind spots exist in people and since I'm passing, then I definitely have a blind spot that I can't see beyond. 
our data about all people ever is just much more than your data about yourself. So whatever you can draw from the data of all people ever, you should rely on that more heavily than what you think you see inside yourself. You just aren't very good at looking inside yourself. And so how can acknowledging these hidden motives in other people help us better understand human behavior in general? Well, so for example, if you're a health policy person or an educational policy person or perhaps a political policy person, uh, the usual approach would be to take the usual things we say we're trying to do and assume that these institutions are in fact, you know, trying to achieve those things. And then you will try to redesign them perhaps or reform them to better achieve these things we say we are trying to do. And then you will present your solutions to the world, expecting perhaps uh, applause and thanks for your uh, promoting the things that people say they want. And then you will be surprised to learn that people don't want the things you propose. So People say, for example, that we go to school to learn the material to be better workers. And if you find a way that people can learn more material better, faster at school, and you present that to the world saying, ta-da, I've helped you go, to, you know, go to school better, you will find that people don't want these things and they aren't interested. And you will then, you know, be frustrated because you were making a mistake about what's going on. So if you want to actually study education or medicine or politics, et cetera, you need to have a better understanding of what's actually going on. And therefore, social scientists and policymakers should read our book and consider what our actual motives are in order to support their analysis. That's one set of people who ought to, ought to know. Another set of people who ought to know perhaps is people for whom understanding other people is especially important to their role in the world, say managers or salespeople, that everything depends for them on their understanding of what their customers or employees want and what their motives are and what they respond to. If you're wrong about those things, you can just do those jobs very badly. So our book will help you understand those things. Now, the key idea here is that Evolution made you unaware of these things. Evolution designed you to be ignorant of your motives and to be misled about your motives. So if evolution was right about your current environment and your overall goals, then it's not in your interest to know what I'm telling you. You should forget it and go back to the usual hypocritical naivete. Um, so... Uh, you do need to be exceptional relative to that standard. Uh, that is, you should either believe the world has changed so much that our evolved instincts are no longer so useful, or that you in particular are different from what evolution guessed about the average person, uh, such that it would be worth your while to consciously be aware and suffer the costs of that. So the reason evolution made you unaware is that being hypocritically unaware and sincerely wrong will better able make was you know better at getting people to like you, getting people to trust you, uh, feeling good about your place in the world and what you're doing. All of those things are supported and aided by your usual hypocritical ignorance of what you're actually doing. Um, so, I want us to explore an, an alternate reality where. Evolution didn't require these things from us. How do you think the world would have evolved otherwise? Or would we have society today? And what would that look like? We are the you know, only species on Earth who has achieved our level of technology and, and civilization. Um, presumably that's because of some unusual features of us. Uh, one of those unused features is presumably our extra-large brains. Our extra-large brains were, in substantial part, created because of our extra-complex com social world. So, um, if we didn't have a very complicated social world, we may not have been as smart and therefore be the successful species that we are. But 
there are probably many ways to be social without necessarily being wrong or hypocritical. So it's hard to tell what other kinds of species there could be who are very social and very functionally social, yet maybe not as misled about their motives. Um, I find that hard to judge. I'm curious, when we have, um, if, if our development, our evolutionary development was preceded by a social need, or if it was driven more accurately by a social need, um, how, how does this tie in, or how does this um, merge with the idea of artificial intelligence? And uh, do you suppose we could have a future where artificial intelligence is deeply social, not only with humans, but with themselves, which then causes them to have like a rapid development because of the social dynamics that they have with themselves. So there's a vast space of possible minds and they can just all be very different from each other. And at some point in the distant future, large regions of that space will be realized. We will create a wide range of kinds of advanced minds, uh, which who are very different from each other. Some of them will be very asocial. Some of them would be very social, uh, but in the near future, when we humans make artificial intelligence, we aren't randomly sampling from the space of possible minds. We are making minds that, you know, satisfy two obvious constraints. One is we're making minds like us because that's what we find it easier to make. And that's also what fits in our world better. That is, we're making AIs that will function in our world, be useful in our world. And we're making AIs like us. So. Both of those things will make them social. That is, uh, to function our world, AIs will need to be social and to interact and be like us, they need to be social. And in fact, the best AIs we have now, the most celebrated AIs are pretty social. So, um, you know, that I expect that to continue. But then how would the hidden motives in our behavior, since we created these AI, how would that factor into, you know, the understanding and development well uh again we're making them like us in, in a very literal direct way and this will make them share many of our hypocrisies and mistakes in fact you know for example uh, gpt4 i asked it many of these social hypocrisy questions and it gives the usual wrong answers it is it is mistaken about its motives or human motives in the same way we are, because that's the kind of, you know, training it gets from trying to be like us. So at the moment they are, they give the same wrong answers about motives. Uh, so they are being trained to think like us and to act like us. And so for, for a while, at least they will be wrong in the same ways. So what do you think would have to happen for them to become more accurate about reality than us. Would that be the part where their social interaction comes in? Well, even so, you know, there can be functional incentives for accuracy in addition to the incentives to be like us and to fit in our world. In some sense, achieving various results in our world may encourage accuracy. Um, so they may well make accurate choices. Now, you don't always need to be explicitly, abstractly correct in order to make accurate choices. So for example, humans function very well in our world without having accurate abstract beliefs. That's the point. So for a while too, AIs would be able to function in our world and accurately function, i.e. achieve their ends without necessarily having accurate abstract beliefs about these things. Because that's what we humans do. But at some point, like I said, with managers or salespeople, there can be an advantage to being correct abstractly. Um, now, one of the things that would probably go along with that living in our world is an ability to dissemble. That is, effective managers or salespeople often are able to have accurate beliefs about their employees and their customers, in part because they can hide them from those customers and employees and they can in their head separately have their more accurate beliefs and then in presentation with their associates have the more usual mistaken beliefs. So um, that would be, you know, 
w one prediction is that the ability to dissemble, the ability to have different thoughts in different contexts and keep them separate from each other would be a prerequisite for them then having more accurate beliefs that are socially disapproved. But then what would be another possibility? By another possibility, I mean, what would be another possibility for AI to um, develop into being more accurate rather than the one you just mentioned? At some point, the AI, an AI-based economy would grow relative to the human economy and even dominate. It would be large, at which point the AIs would mainly be interacting with each other and not so much with humans, at which point placating humans and their distaste of hearing about accurate motives would be less of an issue. So they could just form a subculture of the larger economy wherein they were mainly talking to each other and therefore could be more honest. Have you heard about the um, Red Pill community or the Red Pill movement? Um, I think, you know, 15 years ago, perhaps, that was a name for men who were trying to study mating and have an accurate view of their costs and strategies in mating. Is that it's correct? Precisely what is, yeah, it's precisely what it still is today. And I was just curious to see what your thoughts were on it. Well, we're all at some level pretty aware that we all have a tendency to hide things from ourselves and to to have wishful thinking and to deny reality. And therefore, many groups of people often want to celebrate their subgroup by contrast with the rest of the world and call themselves reality-based or, you know, more realistic as a way of disparaging their opponents and celebrating their own community. So almost everybody does this. Almost all subgroups claim that the other people are self-deceived and won't look at reality, and they're the ones who are realistic. So the fact that this particular group does that as well isn't much evidence that they are, in fact, the accurate people compared to everybody else, right? I mean, that doesn't mean they're wrong. It just means this is what everybody says. They might happen to be the ones who are more realistic. That's a separate question to evaluate, right? So... uh you know, we, we have to look and say, what are the claims these people are making? And then what's the evidence for that? And, you know, how well supported is that in order to judge whether they're accurate? Now, you could say, yes, I mean, one of the things might be, say, the truths we're saying look ugly. And you might say, okay, fine. On average, yes, the things we pretend are true tend to be prettier than the things we uh, that are really true. But the fact that the things you say is really true is ugly is only weak evidence that it's actually true. <laughs> um, not everything ugly is true, even if the true things tend to be uglier, okay? So again, there's no escaping looking at the details and saying, what are the specific claims and what's the evidence for them? Because uh, you, you could be wrong. <laughs> because obviously most groups are wrong in thinking that they're special, different, ideology or creeds are, are right and everybody else is wrong. So, you know, we, we, we can't really get farther in this discussion without hearing some specific claims and the evidence for them. Other, otherwise, we're just observing something that's true about all subgroups is they all want to think that they're more reality-based and, and some of them will take their the ugliness of their claims as evidence that they're right and it's weak evidence, but only weak. Do you think there's such a thing as objective reality or objective truth when it comes to um, human relations or even social relations, maybe not necessarily human? Um, I think everybody believes in objective reality. I think what you mean by a non-objective reality might be a, a more dependent reality. That is... You know, for example, the idea of social constructed reality is the idea that the reality you would see would be different had other social actions gone differently. So just because things are real doesn't mean they wouldn't have been different in some other situation. But that's also real. It's about the dependencies. So 
sometimes what you mean by objective is, you know, the same across a wide range of counterfactual alternatives. It would have stayed the same. So it's less clear which things are that robust to counterfactuals. To that, that is, they would have just been the same regardless of other context. So, but everything that is, is real. The question is real in what sense or, or real with respect to what? I mean, in some sense, like your dreams are real, right? They're real dreams. They just go away when you wake up. So that means they aren't robust to the context change of waking up. And that's the sense in which they are not real. But your dreams, while you're dreaming, really are your dreams, right? But then would we say a hallucination is real based on that premise? Yes, well, we would say that a hallucination uh, goes away quickly with many kinds of disturbances. We slap you in the face, we throw water at you, we, you know, you know, we shake you. There's a bunch of things we can do to you with a hallucination that will make the hallucination go away. So they are real, but they're, they are not very robust to changes. So the things we talk about as more real are things that stay with their features and characteristics more stably in a wide range of things that could disturb them, right? And so then we want to ask, what specific things are you having in mind of as real? And then what kind of disturbances are we considering? And then we can ask, are they real or stable with respect to those kinds of perturbations? So is a personality real? So you can I say, how stable are personalities and what makes them change, right? So certainly we have observed that personalities change with time. So they are not absolutely stable with time, okay? But that the change is slow and it's rare to have someone's personality change dramatically in a short period of time. That's a sense in which they're real. But there are some things that can make somebody's personality change in a short period of time. There are, you know, dramatic experiences people have that change them. But those are rare, right? So that's the sense in which it's real, right? Reality is better cashed out in terms of how stable or robust something is to various kinds of perturbations. So personalities are relatively real in the sense that typically they last a long time. They don't change that much. They change slowly. And it takes pretty big forces to change them. Okay, I want us to talk about your second book, um, The Age of M, where you talk about a future where human minds are uploaded into computers and create, they create um, emulated beings called M's. Um, could you walk me through the concept of how, that, how you came to that conclusion? And could you explain the concept to someone who's never heard of it before? So it's an old concept, doesn't originate with me, a science fiction and futurist concept. Uh, of taking an individual human brain, scanning it in fine spatial and chemical detail to see which cells are where, connected to what, of what type, then having worked out good enough computer models of each kind of cell in terms of signals in and signals out and change of state, so that then you can combine a scan of an individual brain and then make a computer model of each of the cells in that brain in that computer model. And then if you have good enough models of the cells and good enough scan of the brain, then the model you have sh made should have the same input-output behavior. Signals come in and change the state. Signals go out. Which means that if you hook that up to artificial eyes, ears, hands, mouth, etc., then it would behave the same. That is, when signals come in from its eyes or its ears, then it does the processing inside and decides how to move the mouth and move its hands. And then it would do the same things in the same situation as the original human, if you have those things. There. And that's the idea of a brain emulation. And it has obvious vast economic impact in that humans working are the main source of income in the world today. Uh, most income goes to people working. And so if you can make a substitute for people working, uh, you can get all that income going to your products instead of to the humans and make many trillions of dollars. And as a result, society would change drastically. So this is an old concept. I didn't invent this. What I did was try to analyze what would happen in much more detail than other people had 
in part as a proof that it was possible to take a particular speculative technology scenario and work out many details because people often claim that it's impossible to say much about the future uh, and especially in particular it's possible to say much what would happen as a result of various technologies that might arise uh, because that's just too hard and people throw up their hands and say therefore science fiction speculations are the best we could possibly do and have any idea what the future might be like because there's just no way to know and so my effort was to say you know there is ways to know and so i was going to take this one example and prove just how much you could know so my book is full of detail too much tedious detail many people tell me uh, crammed full of detail trying to convince you that i can say a lot about what happens in this world and i do say a lot and it's very different world and a lot changes some people have said they think of it as a hell i think that's just a generic reaction most people have to anything that's very different than their world I think it's an okay world, but it is very different. Uh, if you realize just how different we are from our ancestors, you would expect that the future would be that different. And I think this is a way to show you just how different the future could be. There are many people, I think, who, who just can't believe the world in the next century could see as much change as we saw in the last century. That's, there just isn't enough change possible. They, they just don't think that's conceivable. So surely the world a century from now won't be that different from the now, no matter how different our world was from a century or two or five ago. That's They just look at our world and go, it couldn't change much. And so I'm trying to show you, yes, yes, it could change a lot. Here's a concrete, specific example of just how much it could change. In that world that you, know, you talked about and you expatiated on, what do you think is the immediate social and cultural response of humans to you know, the birth of M's or the invention of M's? Well, right off, we have to ask, are these brain emulations humans? And that's a very sort of fundamental reaction to this. Uh, we are going to have many kinds of descendants in the future, many of whom will vary and differ from us in many ways. And we have a choice about each of them, how much to think of them as us versus not. Um, and I think we often make that reaction in an intuitive way based on very crude heuristics and i think we should reflect on that more um so i think the m's will think of themselves as human they will see themselves as continuous from us and, and our descendants uh and i'm willing to see them that way you might not uh, but i might point out um there's a standard star trek transporter scenario that comes from this TV show Star Trek which had movies made of it later wherein there's this transporter that you get into and it supposedly takes you apart atom by atom figures out where all the atoms are and then sends down a signal to wherever you're going that then rearranges a new set of atoms there in the same way and then ta-da there you are and in philosophy classes they ask students a whole you know hours long discussion about this and discussing is that thing that comes out of the transporter you, if you were the thing who went into the transporter? And after an hour's long discussion, typically the class is divided 50-50. Some people say that's you, and some people say that's not. Now, if you ask the question a different way, you say, you just stepped out of the transporter. Was the thing that stepped into it you? Well, people mostly say, well, of course, yeah, that was me. Now, it's the same question. But when you look back, through the process, you tend to embrace your ancestors as you, even if they're very different from you. When you look forward to your descendants and you see them different, you're not so sure they're you. But they're you. Uh, and certainly, natural selection, our, our theory of evolution, says that uh, evolution would tend to make creatures promote their descendants and support their descendants, even when they're different. So, uh, if you don't, and somehow natural selections strategies for that have misfired in you. Do you think we'd cohabit um, effectively with the M's, or do you think we would? Because our just like you mentioned earlier, our knee-jerk reaction to newness or to technology that we haven't seen before is we berate the technology, and then we later say, okay, okay, we'll probably live with it, right? Do you think our initial responses to 
um, the ev evolution of the M's would be to refute it? And how do you think it would determine the relationship? So you're saying our as if you're talking about the non-M's, <laughs> yes, right? Yes, the non-M's. Okay, so, so, but the M's will be okay with it, right? So I think it's hard to predict transitions, in particular, hard to predict reactions because they're so subject to framing effects. So the transition framing effect is just hard to predict. Uh, I can argue for some framings, but to say what the framing will be is hard. I, I can certainly say that the worse the framing is, the more ordinary squishy biological humans feel a revulsion or hostility or suspicion of these M's, the more troublesome and conflicted the transition would be. There could be war and conflict and all sorts of things that would happen during a transition when there's high levels of suspicion and conflict and revulsion, right? But the economic power that would result from brain emulations and an economy of them would be overwhelming. And so if there's anywhere they can appear and thrive, then, then they would. And that would just displace and take over all the rest. So, and after a conflicted, disruptive transition, the Amazons might be feeling a little resentful and hostile toward the biohumans who resisted and fought them. So, you might want to think about that. How do you think? How do you think um, humans will perceive their individuality? For myself, um, if an M is made from my brain cells, um, I can assume that that's some form of non-biological clone of myself. Um, I don't think I'll take it very lightly. With, with, I mean, I could think, it, I could look at it in two ways. It could be that this is really cool. I'm looking at another human being who is exactly like me, but just not, I, I'm not the one that necessarily has the consciousness that that human being is experiencing. But in every other way, in terms of the genetics, the makeup of that M, the person is just like me. How do you think it would affect our sense of individuality and self-esteem and things like that? Well, we, we haven't had in the past the need to deal with these scenarios. So we haven't developed habits of thinking about how to consider them. And so again, that's subject to framing effects. Depending on different ways of thinking about them, we will have different reactions. And that means you know, some people will think about it one way and some people will think about it another way and some social groups will encourage them to think one way versus another way and so you know that can play out in a lot of complicated ways that's the whole point after the transition though i can more confidently predict how people will react that is once there is an m world and once it's very productive you will not really want to offend the m's too much so you will you will at least pretend that they are uh you know all the things they wish to be and think they are. And then they will actually have concepts of identity that will make them relatively okay, not only with making copies, but even with making short-term copies. A copy that lasts for a few hours and then ends would also be the sort of thing they are okay with. So it would affect not only their concepts of identity, but also of death. When you say copy, do you mean like a physical, actual copy of themselves? Yes. So, uh, that is, a brain emulation is a copy of you, but it's done at great expense and difficulty. But once you have a brain emulation, it's much cheaper and easier to make another copy of it. So the world of brain emulations is very much influenced by the fact that they can easily make copies of themselves. And so they do with wild abandon. And that affects the world. Do you think this would help us um, preserve humanity's best minds or the bio, the current level of biohumans' best minds? For example, if Einstein was alive in such a world, do you think creating an M of Einstein would further the cost of humanity? So you mentioned artificial intelligence earlier. We might as well include that in our discussion here. M's are a kind of descendant, which aren't exactly like us, but like us in many ways. Artificial intelligences are also a kind of descendant who would be also like us in many ways, but still even more different from us than M's. And we can frame these things as an other and feel hostile and suspicious of them and, and, and resentful of their de 
potentially displacing us and want to lock down and control them to ensure that they are enslaved and, and mind controlled so they would never defy our authority and rule. Or we can see them as our descendants and grant them a similar degree of self-autonomy and, and independence in the world as we get from our ancestors. And that's a key choice we're going to be making. Um, in the past, people haven't thought that much about the fact that their descendants are different from them and that maybe they should resent that or try to prevent it. They've usually just accepted the continued phenomena of their descendants being different and knowing that they were distant, different from their ancestors and they had the right to choose how they would be different and expect that their descendants will also have be different and be able to choose to be different. But now that we see our descendants more vividly and can imagine just how different they may be and that imagine that that may happen relatively soon, many people are now wondering, well, why should I let my descendants be different from me? Why should I let my descendants have any autonomy or control at all? Why shouldn't they be my slaves? Why shouldn't I make sure to fully mind control them so that they would never think of defying me? Isn't that how I want the future to go? I in control ruling over all future descendants or we in control ruling over descendants. And many people feel strongly that way that we shouldn't allow these technologies to be pursued until we can find some way to absolutely rule over our descendants. They, they call this alignment, uh, another nice name for slavery and mind control. Um, so that's a question we will face. It's a question our ancestors faced, of course, but we, they never thought about it, right? Now we are perhaps being able to envision these changes and to be horrified by the fact of change, which our ancestors would have been too if they had thought about how much change was coming, but now we are better able to actually envision the change that's coming, and many of us are horrified by how different our descendants could be, and they don't want that. They want their descendants not to be so different from them. Do you think AI is going to converge or diverge from the um, emulated humans? Like, do you think there's going to be some form of conflict within the desires or the intentions or the goals of AI and the goals of these emulated human beings or our emulated selves? Just more generally, we will have many descendants who differ from each other and they can have conflicts with each other. Um, that's always been true in the past. All the different descendants of our ancestors aren't all the same, and they often have conflicts. So, yes, of course, our different descendants will be different and have conflicts. And so should we, ha should we have any ethical considerations ahead of time if there are ways we can currently... I, I mean, I know this is some form of control as well, but then is there any possibility that we can mitigate the potential um, adverse effect of those two technologies or those multiple technologies um, coexisting at the same time? The, the two main, you know, we, we could try to prevent any descendants from existing and then we would prevent all the conflicts. That doesn't seem worth it to me, but I guess that's one strategy. You could try to make sure that we only had one kind of descendant and so the conflicts would be all internal to that group, but those conflicts could still be just as strong. So it's not obvious to me that enforcing hom homogeneity on our descendants will greatly reduce conflict. Um, the most promising approach, I would think, is to try to develop better institutions for mitigating conflict. That is, better mechanisms of cooperation and mutual support. Uh, we have limited technologies for that now. That's why we have so much conflict in our world, but our world has better coordination technologies that our ancestors did, which is why our world is in part more peaceful than our ancestors' world was. So if you want a more peaceful future, develop better mechanism of peace. Uh, that's somewhat independent of which particular descendants we have. What, whoever they are, they will all benefit from better institutions of cooperation and peace. So let's work on those. Speaking of our nearest future, um, what are your predictions for, say, 2030, 2040, 2050, what are the most likely changes that we're going to see that would disrupt what we currently know as reality in those years? I mean, among the people I see on Twitter or whatever, clearly 
the most dramatic predictions people are making is that artificial intelligence will reach a level where it can displace human workers soon and therefore most like humans will lose their jobs soon and that's a pretty big change um i think that's less likely than they think and it will take longer than they think but i do think we should prepare for that by arranging for the right kind of insurance that would deal with the biggest problem that appears in this area um i actually think that a bigger change over a 30-year period will be an increase in remote work. So we saw a dramatic increase in remote work with the pandemic, but it wasn't going along with more effective remote work, really. And we're now we're seeing the retrenchment as people realize that the remote work wasn't very effective and they're going back to the office. But I think over the coming three decades, we will learn better how to do effective remote work, and that will have a pretty dramatic impact on economy and society. We will have more better AI in that time and it will, you know, be a big benefit and good, but maybe a smaller effect than remote work, maybe the same size. Uh, again, I, I, I'm betting that we won't actually see most humans lose their jobs in that period, but there's a risk there and I think we should prepare for that through proper insurance. What makes you think most humans won't lose their jobs? Um, well, first of all, we have this long history where every decade or so, some new dramatic technology comes along and have exciting demos and people constantly say, are we there? Are we are almost there at the point where most people are going to lose their jobs? And people seriously thought that was going to happen over and over again for the last 70 years or even century. So the track record here is that people are just not very good at judging how close we are to this point where most humans would lose their jobs. And I don't think we're any better at judging that now than we were in the past. So the track record suggests it's more likely than not that that's not going to happen. So that's right there. And the next thing you could look at is just look at the actual technologies and look at how close it is to doing most jobs. And it's just not very close. All right, you know, so the latest large language models are good at I don't know, taking tests and writing essays, but that's not most jobs. Uh, the doing most jobs, they're not really very good. So they're still a long way. I generally think that in terms of um, the previous, like if we're looking at precedents, I think people are a bit more skeptical about AI, particularly because um, when, say, 70, 100 years ago, the technology that was replacing jobs then were not necessarily somewhat to a degree self-sufficient. Unlike AI, the large language models are, in a sense, more capable than the average human being, right, in terms of processing power. And so I think that's one of the reasons people are afraid of losing their jobs. They're better at the average human being at taking tests and writing essays, but not most of the other things people do. So, so again, we have this long experience which I think you're having again of people being really impressed by the latest demos and then saying to themselves, gee, I can imagine this doing everything. And we've seen that over and over again. I've seen it across my long life and it happened long before my life. This is a consistent pattern. So you've got to learn from this pattern that people are just not very good at judging how close things are to being able to do all the jobs. So if you were to predict a year or let's say a decade where that would be more likely, what decade would you um, think it would be? 2080. Oh, okay. So we're 60 years. Wait, we have 60 years to go. Oh, bad. That's I mean, enough that's, time yeah. for us yeah, to... Yeah, that's a very middle prediction. It's a very, it's a wider range, but the point is we're, we're still a long way. Okay. And how do you think individuals and societies can prepare for that potential future where the jobs it, are taking over? So... The main risk is that you'll lose your job and then won't have an income and, and would starve. That's the main risk. So that's a good setup for insurance. And most insurance requires individual underwriting, that is extirpating your personal risk. But this one doesn't. This is a collective risk, a risk that we would all have at the same moment. So we only need a single act of underwriting of estimating the entire risk. The whole world economy. So... Uh, so the proposal would be we take assets that are broad assets in the world economy, like they, add, they take stock index funds and they add bond index funds and you add real estate 
And you make an asset that's just a, a mixture of all sorts of stuff in the economy so that it's covering the entire economy as an asset. So you make an asset like that, and then you split it with a bet called a derivative. You, you split it into two parts. One part is the part that pays that asset if a certain event happens, and the other event part is the part that pays if that event doesn't happen. That's a way to split an asset. And the event we want to focus on is that in a certain, say, five-year period, the labor force participation rate falls from, say, a current level of 60%, say, above 50%, down to some low level, say, below 20%. That would be the event of most people losing their jobs. Labor force participation rate is how many people have jobs. So when it goes from 60 down to 20 or 10, that's most people losing their jobs. So that's a measurable thing. So that triggers, you know, when that number falls from 60 down to 20 or below, that triggers the event. And now people who hold this asset that says pays if that event happens, suddenly they get the base asset, which was this portfolio. So now in a, if this chance of this event in five-year period is say 1%, then the cost of that asset is 1% of the cost of the larger asset you see. So for example, um, most people in our, uh, you know, the average, the median income in the US is say $30,000. Uh, and if there's a 1% chance in a year that, you know, this thing would happen, then the cost of an asset that would pay their usual income would be 1% of their salary, i.e. $300. And so, you know, for a risk that has a 1% per year happening and you want to insure against that you, and you want to ensure that you, it will pay your usual income if that 1% chance happens, then it would cost you on average $300 a year to get the insurance to pay for this asset. So that's the level of expense we're talking about. So in the early years, which it's now, is where the chance is low, it'll be relatively cheap to buy this insurance that pays off later on when uh, everybody loses their job. So it's straightforward to set, create these assets, require some legal permission, and the idea is just to create this asset and tell people to buy it. If you're worried about robots taking jobs, we'll buy some of this asset. It's an asset that pays off exactly when robots take the jobs. And in order to make this work, somebody has to buy the other side of the asset. And the people who are buying that are basically selling the insurance. And the people who should sell the insurance are people who are less worried about losing their jobs. This, but people who have other forms of capital or will be retired for the reason, they would be buying the opposite side of the split. And in essence, selling the insurance. And the people who are afraid of losing their jobs are buying the, the insurance side of the asset. And that works to insure people against losing jobs. It, it costs money, but it had to cost money. It's, you're, you're trying to guarantee a payout in a certain situation. It's got to cost something to guarantee that payout, uh, it, but it will be a fair insurance price based on the fair odds of the event happening. Um, at the beginning of the podcast, we were talking about the idea of uh, the, the latest idea you've been researching, which is the idea of the secret. How do you think the sacred would be redefined in a world like this? So a world where there's ends and there's AI and other future descendants of humans. How do you think the sacred would be redefined? Or is it only privy to them? Is it only the people living in those times that can tell how, you know, they would redefine the sacred? I think we're struggling to understand the past changes in the sacred. <laughs> Projecting future changes gets even harder. So it seems like the first thing to do is, I mean, the first order of business is understand what the heck the sacred is. Just what is it and why is it there and how does it work? Then when you have that, then you might try to understand changes in the sacred over time. So, so obviously one of the biggest changes that's happened is that, you know, a century or two ago, religion was an organizing force around the sacred. Religion claimed, and most people believed that it did, in fact, uh, unify the sacred. That is, God told you what other things were sacred, and you treated those as sacred because religion told you they were sacred and how sacred. And now religions become a much weaker force in our society, but we still have many things that are sacred. They're just no longer so, uh, you know, 
treated as sacred because of the authority of religion, now they have a separate basis for being treated as sacred. And now they contend with each other at times for how sacred they're going to be. So, for example, I think one of the biggest things that's happened in the last half century in terms of the sacred is that once upon a time, marriage was more sacred than love. And when push came to shove, many people, when we saw a conflict between marriage and love, many people decided that, in fact, love was more sacred than marriage. And so the sacredness of marriage declined and the sacredness of love rose. And many aspects of identity politics in the last half century have also been based on the idea that people say, you know, I, my, you know, authentic concept of love and feeling of love requires that you accept, you know, cross-racial love, that you accept uh, homosexual love, that you accept non-binary love. And the invocation of those kinds of loves as sacred has pushed for uh, many other kinds of changes in identity acceptance because of the sacredness of love. So we've made love the prime, prime sacred thing compared to these other things, and that's driven some other changes. I don't know that we fully understand why that change happened, but you can see that had a big effect over the last half century. Um, and, you know, until you understand why it happened, it's going to be hard to project future changes and why they would happen. I think we're still at the, you know, maybe we're at the point where we know at least what the sacred is and how it works and that we see there are these conflicts between the sacred and then often you know, which when we see a conflict between two sacred things, that pushes us to see one of them as not so sacred, because in some sense, one of our norms of the sacred is there should, shouldn't be conflicts between sacred things. Sacred things are all one unity of sacred. So if we see a conflict, that means one of the things isn't really sacred. And that's a big driving way that we fight over. So for example, another ish thing of sacredness is um, nations. How sacred are nations? and how sacred is war and um and peace and in many ways we have the sacredness of nations and war has declined and because it conflicts with the sacredness of life and we're seeing less nationalism and less inclination to war because of that conflict um, but predicting where it goes. So I have one organizing principle that I think can roughly explain a lot of the past trends, and that's the transition from foragers to farmers and back again. So the idea is that for a million years or so, humans were foragers, and we evolved greatly as foragers, and we evolved so much that our natural instinctive behaviors made sense in a forager world. But because we were culturally plastic and could change our culture, uh, you know, through having cultural evolution making different cultures, that allowed us to become farmers because farmers required very different cultures and different values. And our cultural evolution succeeded in doing that, succeeded in changing culture and changing, making cultures that were more suited to farming. But it came at the bit of a cost of repressing our forager nature. That is, farmers are a bit repressed. Farmers use self-control to repress their forager nature, to do what's right by farmers. And so they have more of a concept of sin and, um, un, you know, being naturally wrong, naturally sinful. And they use self-control to, you know, make the farmer world, which farmer world has property and war and slavery and marriage and inequality and all sorts of things that foragers hated but farmers came to accept and even celebrate. Uh, but a lot of the mechanisms that turn foragers into farmers were mediated by poverty and the threat of death. So for example, when a young farming woman is tempted to have a child out of wedlock, which is a very natural temptation for a forager, happens quite often for foragers, the farming woman is told that if she does this, she and her child may die, and she can see credible examples of that around her, and she can believe that she better follow the forager norms or she will suffer severe consequences. And that kept farmers roughly in line. And in the last few centuries, we've gotten rich 
and getting rich has taken away many of the pressures that turn foragers into farmers. The farming, young farming woman and everybody else looks inside themselves and say, yeah, but what do I want to do? And these threats just don't seem as very severe. The young woman in our society says, well, if I have a child out of wedlock, I see these other women having children out of wedlock. They seem okay. I could be okay. And she is just less terrified of the threats that in the past made them go along. So in the last few centuries, we've drifted back toward forager attitudes and values in many ways as we get rich. And that explains many trends in the last few centuries. Uh, again, slavery, decline in religion, a decline in fertility, a decline in marriage, an increase in promiscuity, increase in travel, increase in leisure and art. A whole bunch of trends over the last few centuries can be understood as going back to forager values and attitudes as you get rich. So that, I think, does help understand the change of marriage and love and war and nationalism and slavery and many other sorts of changes in sacredness. Um, and that predicts, you know, continuing in that direction, except the age of M is no longer a world of being rich. So the age of M or AIs aren't rich either. And so um, it predicts a reversal of some, in some degree, that if in a world of brain emulations, the emulations themselves are, are not rich, they're poor. And therefore, they have more need of social pressure. And they can make more use of social pressure to get them to adopt whatever behaviors make sense for their world. Do you think the transition from the forager to the farmer was pressured by, was, in, was brought about by prosperity? And if that's the case, um, I think there's some form of conflict in the trend. So the other, I mean, forager to farmer was not a prosperity transition. That is, because farming could just make a lot more food, uh, that was a pressure to adopt the farming style, but individual farmers were, no, were not any richer than individual foragers. In fact, they were poorer in many ways. So it was a survival pressure, basically. R right, it was, it was a selection effect. That is, if, if some areas switched to farming, they would just have a lot more people. And if they had a conflict with a neighboring area that hadn't switched, well, they would win because they, they could just win the fight with a lot more people. So conflicts of styles of behavior between neighboring regions, the farmers would just win because they just had a lot more people. But the farmers weren't richer. Each individual farmer was, in fact, poorer in the sense they had less varied uh, food. They were more at risk of disease. Uh, they had less variety of of work and um, they had more inequality and slavery and war. A lot of things went wrong for the farming world, but they still won their conflicts with the neighboring foragers. Do you think, what do you think is the future of um, religion based on this direction? I mean, we've seen a clear dereligionization over the years. Over the last few centuries, we've seen a decline in religion and that's gone along with increasing wealth. And it makes sense, you know, in the sense that like, Foragers have a lot of spirituality, but not so much religion. And spirituality is not so much declining. It's the religion that's declining. And if, if you know, the obvious thing is to expect that to continue as we continue to get rich. But if we have a transition to a world where our descendants are not rich, like brain emulations or AIs would be, then that, that bets off, right? No longer is that the force that's changing things. So I think the robust thing to say is that Religion does seem to have had a social function, especially in the farming world. It, it wasn't just a random thing. It, it actually made the farming worlds more tightly bound and better able to enforce their social norms. That function would be useful in a future world of brain emulations or AIs, and so they would have it. They would use this useful social tool to achieve its usual ends. So yes, it's a social technology and it works, and so they'll use it. Good. Okay, um, and the last question I have for you is, how do you approach your work, your health, and your relationships in the light of what you understand about humanity, the elephant in our brains, the future of the world, and you know the contribution that you want to have on the world? How do you, what's your collective approach to all of that? Or is there a more nuanced approach? And if there is, what is it? I'm just one person in the world. Um, I think, you know, I specialize in certain research topics and I want to advance those, but those don't necessarily change how I live my life personally, other than trying to 
you know, promote the research. Uh, uh, as in terms of the future stuff, I happen to be a cryonics customer. That is, I am a person who is paid so that my brain will be frozen when I die and then it will sit frozen for as long as it takes until uh, technology would allow me to come back, which would be in the form of a brain emulation. So I would be I would be there and see the new world of brain emulation. So that's the most straightforward way in which my futurism affects my life now is that I hope to be there. And I am taking my best shot at being able to come back and be there in that world through this technology of cryonics. But the chances are low because most likely this organization will fail to preserve me. But if it doesn't fail, then I will be around and come back. Um, in terms of the elephant in the rain and hidden motives, uh, as, as I said, my first react assumption is that I'm like everybody else. My first assumption is that, in fact, this isn't personally beneficial to know and change my life. That is, we were designed to be ignorant of these things for a reason, and I'm probably better off acting as if I'm ignorant of these things. And it's only to the degree I'm an exception in certain ways that it would make sense for me to accommodate my understanding of this. The exceptions I told you were as a social scientist or policymaker, I should see the world through these lenses in order to better make policy recommendations. But that's not about my personal life. That's more about the larger world. Um, Although, as I'm more of a nerd, uh, you know, my intuitive social reactions don't go as well as other people, so I have more room for conscious analysis of things. One of the things the elephant in the brain tells you, though, is that, for example, um, education is less about learning useful things and more about showing off. Uh, medicine is less about actually getting well and more about reassuring your associates that you care about them. So that means in those areas, I realize that I should be less stressed about how much medicine I or my associates get because it's not actually that useful, but I should make sure I show that I care about them. And for education, I should less be concerned about how much, whether my kids learn useful stuff in schools because none of it's very useful, uh, but I should make sure they get some so that they can show the world they're smart enough. Um, those are sort of practical implications. Uh, they basically say, well, yeah, no, a lot of stuff in the world's for show. And it, you know, the, the supposed serious stuff that people claim it's about isn't really so serious or real. And I got to make sure I and my associates do enough of the sh for show to get by and then not so worry about, just don't worry so much about the other stuff that's supposedly being shown because it's not really there. Do you, in what way does it, um, I know I mentioned that it was going to be my last questions, but I'm just deeply curious in what ways, in what ways does it, um, affect your politics, your personal idea of politics, or are you not interested in politics generally? Politics is one of the chapters in the elephant in the brain. And it says, we claim that our motive about politics is to, um, you know, make the nation or city, et cetera better function better and have better policy. But in fact, our main motives is just to show loyalty and allegiance to our political allies. So I apply that to myself and I say, I guess I don't care that much. Nobody cares that much about actual policy. I care about showing my associates that I share their values. So I try to make sure I do enough of that. But as part of my intellectual package, I try to design a better social institutions. And this helps me understand why people are not very interested in proposals for institutional change because they're not very interested in actual policy at all in any form. Politics isn't about policy to a first approximation. Uh, so that's why policy reform proposals are not very interesting to most people. If the average person wants to preserve their, you know, brains as well, because I, I think I'm deeply interested in the idea of preserving my brain for, you know, the possible future. How can I go about that? Or is this something I have to qualify to be included in? It's just a commercial product. You can just buy it. There are several suppliers. Look up the word cryonics and search for companies that offer this product. And you will find some. The, the remarkable fact is that um, this product has been offered for, you know, since 1960s. Uh, in that time period, only, say, 3,000 people have ever purchased the product. Only 300 people have ever received the product itself uh, in terms of, as opposed to buying it ahead of time and being ready to buy it. 
And even though it's got free international publicity, um, you know, people have regular news articles about it because it's such a weird thing. I want to read about it. So there's clearly a huge psychological whatever aversion to this. Uh, you know, if you ask people, do you think this will work? A, a large fraction, at least 10% of people, well, yeah, that makes sense. I think that will work. But almost none of those 10% actually buy the product or arrange to buy the product. So um, i got to say that'll probably happen to you too. Uh, so, you know, it's an interesting thing to understand. Why are people so averse to this? And I think the obvious explanation is because it makes you look weird. I mean, what's the worst case scenario? You'd be dead by the time you'd need the product. The worst case scenario, again, is the social reaction. So again, remember from the beginning, people are concerned about how other people will socially react to this. They don't care so much about the thing itself. They care about the social reaction. And so people react badly socially to this. Uh, so a similar number of people spend a similar amount of money to when they die, have their ashes thrown into space. And the relatives don't mind that so much. It doesn't bother them so much. Relatives are bothered by this. Why? Because they think you think it might work. That's what bothers them. Nobody thinks ashes being thrown into space are going to bring you back. That's just a weird, cute thing. It costs money, but who cares? What do you think would ha have to happen? Would there have to be like maybe the elites taking over the cryonic space and then that causes a switch and then there's more general adoption? That, that would be one potential path and enough of the right sort of elites uh, take it on and then it becomes a sexy elite thing, but that hasn't happened yet. It could. I, I have to get many elites to watch this show then. <laughs> so they probably will be able to see the compost. The... Probably won't be enough. I can remember it. This, this topic has had free international publicity for, you know, since the 1960s, 60 years, right? Free international publicity. And that hasn't made the difference so far. So a little more publicity isn't obviously going to do much. Is it very expensive? Not that expensive. Not compared to like end of life medical care in general. And certainly it's the sort of thing you can afford with insurance buying ahead of time. So that's not the main limitation. If a lot more people bought this thing, it would be a lot cheaper and more reliable. So, uh, you know, the expense is because there are so few people who buy it uh, that you know, whoever is providing it has to mostly wait around for the next person. Again, only 300 people have ever gotten the product. So the people who are ready to provide the product very rarely, they're not doing one a day, right? What do you think happens in a scenario where a person has brain cancer while they are alive? Does that person still qualify to, does the product become void for the person or is there a way to extract the cancer and then, you know, keep the brain? So, you know, whether you can actually use this product depends on the way in which you die. Obviously, if you fall into a volcano or out of a plane, it's just, it's just not going to be something that works for you, right? Uh, then there are degenerative diseases, diseases that, you know, by which you decay inside as you're dying. And so then you have the issues, should you try to stop that early or wait until the last moment when you're very degenerated? So that's been a dispute along the way. Um, and, you know, so there are many things that can go wrong, but again, if you don't take this chance at all, you're guaranteed that you don't have a chance. So it's more getting a chance versus no chance, but it's not a guaranteed chance. There's lots of things that can go wrong, right? You could die in a plane crash. You could die after a degenerative disease where there's not much left of you. You could, you know, it could turn out that your family opposes it and won't do it. Uh, you know, there's just lots of things that can go wrong. Thank you very much for coming on the show, Robin Hansen. And nice thank you. you for joining the revolution. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Take care.